KLIN. All right, Monday, April 18th. We've got Governor Ricketts in the studio. Welcome, Governor. Uh, thanks for having me in. I appreciate it. It's yeah, good to we, be in studio. We said we're just going to dig right into it. But I first want to say, just because it came to my attention, uh, ZZ Top, folks, is going to be at Pinewood Bull Theater on Sunday. That's awesome. August 21st, uh, which before we get into all the things we want to talk to you about, uh, what's your favorite group? I was just listening to oh, Howard man. Jones from the 1980s, early 90s. Well, 80s on the way were in. the best music decade ever. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. So many great groups. So, well, man. Uh, uh, while you think about it, yeah. folks, if you don't know this, I'll give you this one. John Cook, our our volleyball coach, it is Pearl Jam for him all the way. Uh, Pearl like, Jam's a good choice. Yeah, he's a crazy Pearl Jam fan. Yeah. Oh, really? Like, people would never get. I when he told me that, I kind of balked, and then we started talking, and I realized it's it's more than just a fan. Like he is a true Pearl Jam fan. Oh, that's cool. So I didn't know, you, you know, you're a well-traveled guy and spent some time in Chicago. I thought, well, he's probably got somebody he listens to from the 80s. Yeah, oh, well, um, I'm a big you got 38 special. Oh, that's a good one. Billy Joel, Journey. Oh, I mean, you can't go wrong with Billy Joel, the yeah. piano man, I think. Yeah. And even Journey, so, there's Billy so many. Joel, I've seen Billy Joel. Pro- Billy Joel's probably one of the people I've seen the most in concert. Really? Um, because he used to make this, like, you know how he plays the garden all the time. Mm-hmm. Well, he also used to go to Wrigley Field before the pandemic. He went to gotcha. Wrigley Field like every summer and always put on a great show. Wow. Well, there you go. You've learned something new always about Governor Ricketts when he comes on Drive Time Lincoln. I am the host, Jack Riggins. Mark Vale is producing the show today. Johnny Cadillac is on a cruise somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico. We wish him all the safety, no COVID, uh, no, cra- no, no crashes, meaning have to get in the lifeboat. <laughs> <laughs> I, told, I don't think there's too many icebergs in the Gulf of Mexico. I think he's pretty safe. No, he should be, but you never know with these cruises. It's something I never want to do is go on a cruise with all the ship time I spent. Uh, and, and, and as a Navy guy, I didn't, I didn't right. spend a lot of time on ship. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about as we're ending the legislative session is highlights. Yeah. Nebraskans. Well, it's very appropriate that we're here today on tax day, right? <laughs> because we passed the most significant tax relief program ever. Ever in the history of the state of Nebraska. Uh, LB 873 will extend our property tax. So, for example, this year tax day. So, if you haven't applied for it, you got till midnight, right? Uh, you can get a 25.3% rebate back on whatever you pay into your local school district and property taxes from the state. You got to fill out the form PTC, standing for property tax credit, but we'll give you a refundable tax credit for 25%, over 25% of what you pay into your local school district. So that's significant. That's real money for folks. So don't forget to apply for that this year. PTC, folks. Yeah, exactly. And your Nebraska state income tax. That was set to go down in 2024, but we are extending it now, so it'll actually go up, not down. And then we're going to add another credit on top of it, not this year, but in future years, where you'll get a credit back on the property taxes you pay to your community college. So you'll get another credit back on your property taxes. We're accelerating the tax relief for our Social Security. So we're going to, we had phased out Social Security taxes last year for over 10 years. Now we're going to get it done in five years. So making that faster for our seniors so they can handle this runaway inflation. And then we're taking our income tax rates down from 6.84% to 5.84% over the next five years. And business taxes down from 7.5% to 5.84%. So in my administration, we've delivered about $4 billion in property tax relief. This will add another $3.4 billion by 2027. And it is 12 times higher than any tax relief package passed in any previous administration. So this is truly historic. Yeah. Now, one of the things I always think is funny with this, Jack, is that we sign this bill. We do with all the, like, all this, all the people, like, all this. We had 25 senators there. So over half the legislature's there. We had all the other people who were helping out, all the different groups, uh, you know, Farm Bureau, Cattlemen, AARP, you know, all these people are there. It's a big deal. We do it in the rotunda, lots of people. The next day, you know what's on the copy, the front page of the Omaha World Herald? <laughs> literally pink flamingos. It is literally pink flamingos. This historic tax bill gets one column on the front page of the middle of the section, but one column, not even like a banner headline, it's one column. Now, I will say the Journal Star did it right. They, did, they put a nice, you know, big story on the front page of the paper for the Journal Star to recognize <laughs> this is kind of a big deal. It's a difficult but, time for conservatives <laughs> across mass media, isn't it? It is. It is. <laughs> you know what? I, pink flamingos, literally pink flamingos. We're not even in Florida. Oh, boy. Um, 
Well, there you go, folks. I mean, there's a real cause and effect there <laughs> on on what you are being told what's going on in the state when we, and we all know how we feel about taxes in Nebraska, and we get historic tax relief. Um and you get pink flamingos on the there. front page of the World Herald. <laughs> well, last time I remember, though, Governor, that's uh, that's your city up there. And, and, yeah, and, and no, I know. <laughs> it's, but it's tax day, though. Everybody, if you haven't filed your tax, don't forget your affordable income tax. You got to get that. Next yeah. year's going to get even better. Yeah. Well, hey, one of the things, boy, it, you, <laughs> I hate to even go there, but uh, this inflation. I mean, thank God we're getting some tax relief. But this administration in Washington and what's happening. Are you hearing? from ranchers farmers because one of the things i'm concerned about is the longer term impacts as food prices rise right now we're all focused on gas prices but with this it seems to be runaway inflation it is, absolutely and you can tie it exactly back to what the okay two things actually you can tie it back to between march of 2020 and march of 21 the fed federal reserve doubled our already huge balance sheet, which means they just added on a lot more assets, right? Mm -hmm. So that built the bonfire and they poured the gasoline on it. And then the Democrats, on a party-line basis, passed this $1.9 trillion stimulus package, added like 10% to the money supply or whatever it is. That was the match that lit this runaway inflation. You can tie it directly back to March of last year, how this just took off with that point. I mean, at some point, you can only print so much money and of course you're going to get inflation, right? And when you throw that much money into the economy, of course you're going to get inflation. And I know the president's out there saying, oh, you know, Ukraine. It's like, guys, hey, we, Mr. President, we were all here for the last 15 months, right? We lived it. Don't try to tell us this is all about Ukraine because it's not true. Inflation took off in March of 2021 and gas price, 75% of the increase in gas prices happened before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So don't give us this light about, oh, this is all about Ukraine. It's just not true. Well, I think by polling, a lot of Americans are seeing through it. And there's another thing that's really interesting. I don't know. I've been keeping decent tabs, but we were talking about free speech. We were talking about the press kind of just covering things. But uh, at some level, you must be interested in what Elon Musk is trying to do with Twitter. Trying to buy Twitter. Take it private and say, we're going to just let people... Like, we're not going to like try to put our thumbs on the scale of political discourse, discourse right. right? I mean, like, God bless him. I hope he's yeah. actually what he's trying to do. Yeah, I, mean, I just hope a, he's and trying a separate to do that, tie too. And like, stream of consciousness tying it back to Ukraine. I understand Elon Musk has like, put his little satellites over Ukraine, and that's one of the reasons why we're getting all this and making it free to everybody. So yeah, uh, he, that's one I of the th- reasons why we're getting all the video and everything from Ukraine. Yeah, I think people don't understand is very early on in the war, he moved private satellites uh, from whatever company over so that there was coverage and cell service and things like that. So, um, yeah, pretty neat. I mean, besides what I would say is a sitting conservative governor, he, as a private citizen, is doing a lot of great things to help out. And anyway, I I will hope that uh, he's successful in Twitter. I did like his statement where he, he believed that free speech is essential to a civil society Absolutely. and a Western yeah. society. And it seems weird in 2022 that okay. you and I would have to talk about that. And, uh, no kidding. You would think it would just be a natural. So it's complete non sequitur. I also listened to a podcast called Hardcore History by Dan Carlin. Okay. Dan Carlin's got an addendum, which is only like an hour long. So usually he does like much longer podcast things, talking about different aspects of history. But he did a, a speaking thing with Elon Musk. And talking about World War II fighter planes and like getting into the engineering and the technology and octane of gasoline and things like that. I mean, like Elon Musk is a total geek about that stuff. It's oh, pretty, yeah. if you like history, especially yeah. World War II history, I totally recommend it. Hardcore history, Dan Carlin, he's got an interview with Elon Musk. It was, it was a ton of fun. Yeah. Interesting stuff going on that I think, you know, on the national, international scale that all Nebraskans should pay attention to. Water, the reason I want to bring it up is because the last time I saw you, we were both in Grand Island speaking. You before me, and you set me up good because I because <laughs> I wasn't wearing the right clothes, folks. Um, but your governor didn't could, get that business attire memo, did you? I Jack? did not. And the, but the, but the governor could not get out statewide tourism and recreational water access and resource sustainability committee, otherwise known as Star, Star Wars. Wars. Right. Um, but I know you just signed some stuff in, and I'm I'm actually a big fan of. Um, what we've got to do to maintain our water, but also the new recreational lake going in, because I, I think recreational lakes are one of the greatest places for tourism or in-state. And to know. hold on to our people here, young people here, right? Yeah, get so, people yeah, together. Absolutely. So you talk about highlights. This is one of the, the like second big highlight I would talk about is two bills, LB 1015 and LB 1023 that we passed to, one, invest in our water infrastructure, expanding the marina 
at Lewis and Clark Lake, building one at Lake McConaughey, uh, convention center and lodge at Niobrara State Park, and then this lake between Lincoln and Omaha, 3,600 acres, get that started. Um, huge for recreation, also allows us to you know, store more water here in the state, which I think is absolutely important for us. And then 1015 allows us to begin the project to build a canal from the South Platte River in Colorado to a reservoir system in Nebraska, which is the only way that we can protect our water rights on the South Platte River. And Colorado's announced essentially they're going to take all our water. Um, they only want to, their words, the legally allowable minimum and uh, to Nebraska. So we got to do this to be able to make sure we can protect our water rights and continue. And it impacts, you know, the city of Lincoln estimated about 7% of the water coming to Lincoln, there's 7% of drinking water comes from that South Platte River. So mm-hmm. you lose, you know, the city of Lincoln is always telling people to conserve water now because we're looking at a drought. If you had 7% less water, guess what? That means it's even harder for us to meet yeah. our water needs. Yeah, I think Here it'll be. Lincoln. I think it'll be one of those things. Um, first of all, from east to west, um, water recreation for everyone that's easily accessible. But I also think that unfortunately, it may not be appreciated in the at this moment. As there's always been some people. Yeah, 10 years from now, people are really going to like it, though. That's what I mean. It'll be one of these things where people are like, geez, thank God we had that foresight. Um, no doubt about it. I, I mean, it, a lot of great things. I guess Colorado didn't get the memo that uh, the Rockies flow uh, east. And, right. uh, you know, all it's the all food water. all the food and stuff is grown out here right. for, for yeah. them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, Coloradoans, maybe one day we can... Uh... Well, and here's the other thing. You know, 50 years ago, we created our system of natural resource districts that help us manage our water. And we've kept our Ogallala Aquifer within one foot of where it was in the 1950s. Colorado, by contrast, has mined theirs. They're almost 15 feet down from where they were in the 1950s. And Kansas is almost 20, or is over 26 Ooh. feet down. So we've done a great job managing our water while other states have not. Yeah, and folks, again, you might not appreciate it today, but in the out years, as time goes on, water resource management is huge. Yeah, you know, to the sovereign of the state and our people, and appreciate you doing that. Um, some of the big national things I've seen, and you've talked about them before, but at least I'm proud of them. Is employment at an all time high? Yep. Um, just came out with a study that uh, we're the most recession proof state, state yep. in the union. Just came out today, and um, unemployment is the lowest in the United States. Yeah, and the um, lowest in state history. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Hitting on all cylinders. Why is there not major press coverage? No, I don't want to talk about that. Because <laughs> we put pink flamingos on the cover of the World World Herald. Yeah, but that's something you have to be proud of. And I know that ties into, you know, even with the Treasury now coming out and saying, oh, we, they need rental aid. I love nothing more than the Treasury telling a governor and us, How to run people our own in state. the state, yeah, what we need. Yeah. You know, the, the Treasury said, oh, you know, you, we're, we're willing to work with you on this. And I'm like... Well, we'll respond back to the Treasury. You know, we'll send them a nice letter back. But one of the things that nobody's able to show me, for months I've been asking this from the people who want us to extend ERAP, but nobody can show me that somehow today in 2022, things are different from pre-pandemic 2019, right? I mean, in fact, but I can tell you we've got almost 20,000 more people employed. We've got the lowest unemployment rate in state history. Our revenues at the state are going through the roof, which means that we've got lots of activity, both on the individual level, you know, the business level, you know, the economy's doing great. All these are indications that, you know, we are past the pandemic and we, we're out of an emergency. In fact, I ended the emergency here in the state of Nebraska last summer, as June of last year. So we've got, you know, 52 people in the hospital right now with COVID. I mean, this, at some point you have to acknowledge you're past the emergency. The emergency is over. We got to get back to normal. Yeah, one of the things that frustrated me all through COVID and even towards the end, and I I pray that at least leaders don't go back to some of the ways we were handling it nationwide and whatever. I wish everybody handled it like Nebraska did as a whole. Not Lincoln, Nebraska. (laughs) But it's that you have to realize... Right. There, there's the medical piece of it, but there's an economical piece. There's a societal piece. And, and it's those other pieces. Depression's up in young people. School's been disrupted. And I think we've handled it as well as anybody can. Well, yeah. I mean, that National Bureau of Economic Research just came out with a study last week that uh, looked at states like Florida and California. And Florida, relatively light touch, big state, though, big population centers. California, locked down hard. And when you looked at mortality rates... No, really no benefit for California. They really got nothing out of it. And yet, you can see Florida did so much better in education, did so much better in economy. I mean, so California locked down hard and really cost kids their education, uh, cost business, closed businesses and so forth. And, you know, I'm 
since I'm talking about this report, I'll just go ahead and throw out Nebraska got an A-plus rating. We came out number two, you know, just behind Utah as far as overall pandemic response. Because, again, we took a very light-touch approach like Florida did and you know, slowed down the spread of the virus, kept our mortality rates down, but then kept kids in schools, kept businesses open. And, you know, you have to take a bigger picture. And that's one of the problems we had, in my opinion, is you had public health people that were focused on a very narrow band of the overall impact of coronavirus. And as political leaders, we've got to look at the bigger picture. We always have to look at the bigger picture. And you just can't outsource your thinking to a public health official. Certainly, you take their feedback, but you've got to look at the bigger picture. And I, I fear so many public officials did not. They just kowtowed to whatever the public health official said. Yeah, I used to equate it in my own mind to, um, again, I realize uh, elected officials have a strategic view um, and public health officials, you know, are looking at one line and they're giving the best advice they can. But, you know, in the military, the the commanders used to have all authority. So even if, you know, I use the example, we have guys that lost a limb, but they still wanted to serve. Of course, medically, it it said, hey, this person can't serve, right, without Mm -hmm. a limb. But you could see that they wanted to be there, and you'd get the prosthetic, and then we'd go ahead and say, Commander's prerogative, this person can can serve, there's a need for him in the force, and we'd make that happen. Now, in general, that didn't necessarily make any sense to people, right? Especially in the medical field, where you go, well, they don't have a leg. Well, they have a prosthetic, and they can make it work, and here you go. So this bigger picture, I think, is the best way to approach these scenarios, and, and we did a pretty darn good job, and all the data shows that. Yeah, you know. absolutely. I mean, that's, and then, you know, I talked, we talked about the National Bureau of Economic Research, but before that, Politico ranked us number one in pandemic response. And Politico's not exactly known for being a conservative news outlet. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good to know in Politico, they recognize what we got going on. We'll have to, I'll have to drive up to Omaha and slap some people around. <laughs> hey, we're on with uh, Governor Pete Ricketts. Uh, we're going to have him on for about 10 minutes in the second segment. Got a few more questions, maybe on his future. We're going to talk about the border crisis because I think that it's easy with all this going on with inflation, a war in Ukraine. Um, that all of us start to forget about the border crisis. And in fact, that affects us as Nebraskans. And I know that the governor knows a lot about it, so I want to pick his brain there. What else is going on? Uh, Branch Oak Observatory, as well as uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship, will be on very late in the show to give us an update on what they've got going on. And uh, what what do we know? We know the governor likes 80s music. Best music decade ever. Ever. No doubt about it. There's no, Oh, Mark Vale doesn't like that. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. We're going to have to get his input on that one. You bet. 1499.3 KLIN. Drive Time Lincoln with the commander, Jack Riggins, on the voice of Lincoln. 1499.3 KLIN. All right, we're back on with uh, Governor Pete Ricketts here on Drive Time Lincoln. Golden Earring, that's another great band. That is, and yeah. I have them on the playlist too, as yeah. a matter of fact. I should. I was actually thinking when I drove in, I was like, we need to get some Golden Earring and, uh, on the show. But we don't have a lot of music on this show, just intros right. and outros. It's just intros, right, right. Um, big things with law enforcement and corrections yeah, so that you've done big, as well. Yeah, so probably the big, the third big highlight of this legislative session, kind of sticking to that theme we started you yeah. know, a half hour ago or so, is law enforcement. Uh, investments in the Law Enforcement Training Center in Grand Island to be able to add capacity there to be able to do training for our law enforcement officers. Investments in our crime lab here in Lincoln to be able to increase capacity here uh, to be able to help them with, um, you know, making sure we can get justice for the victims of crime. Um, you know, we want to get all those processed. And then a number of other great bills that are going to help attract and recruit, uh, you know, law enforcement officers to be able to help them stay here in the state or to get them from outside the state and so forth. So it's going to be, we're going to have a, a bigger thing on this, uh, you know, later in the week, but it's, but there's a lot of great stuff for law enforcement in this legislative session as well. It's coming later this week. Uh, we kind of broke it here, but I think that, uh, The investment always in law enforcement and the legal system law, anything around there, the more we we can do, the better. Um, Yeah, I'm going to take a second to plug my podcast, The Nebraska Way. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you can go Google it and go find it on (laughs) iTunes and everybody else. But the one we just, our podcast we just released with Tony Connor, who's the president of the Omaha Police Officers Association. So great interview with Tony talking about how, what our law enforcement officers do to keep us safe. Just a, it was a great, great show, great program. Tony does a great job, and it just does remind us that you know these folks put their lives on the line for us. The women and men who put on the blue are willing to sacrifice themselves for us, and their families sacrifice along with them. 
and they do so many great things for our community. They're a real asset to our community. So we always want to support our blue. Yeah, without a doubt, uh, support the blue and, uh, you know, Fire and rescue and first responders, it's, it's something that we always have to do well, as a society. And, and just to, I want to throw this out there, too. So if you look at during the George Floyd riots, right, Omaha allowed the police to do their job and ask for National Guard help. And Lincoln did not. They kept the police inside the buildings and didn't want National Guard help. Ten times the amount of damage in Lincoln as in Omaha, even though Lincoln's a smaller city. So it just goes to show you, if you let the police do their job, they will help keep you safe. Well, Governor, you just helped me win some listeners because I think a lot of my listeners, when I talk about that, think I've gone crazy. But the fact is, I haven't gone crazy. We've got to we've got to support law enforcement locally, statewide, and I'm glad you're you're on the forefront of that. Um, and we're going to get this thing fixed in Lincoln. You wrote a good we could call them on the border crisis, and I want to just finish and kind of talk about that real quick, and not only nationally but how it's affecting Nebraskans. Yeah, absolutely. So last fall, I went down to the border with nine of my colleagues because we've been asking for me with President Biden about the crisis down there. He refuses to talk or even acknowledge us. And then um, we said, fine, we'll put out our plan so that the world can see it. Mr. President, if you're not going to talk to us, we'll tell the world. And it was a 10-point plan really based upon what President Trump had done to bring illegal border crossings to a 40-year low under the Trump administration with things like uh, you know, the enforcing Title 42 and the Remain in Mexico policy, building the wall, supporting our border uh, 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 folks, all of our border officers. And the Biden administration rushed to undo those. And now last year we saw over 2 million, just 2 million. These are the people that the Customs and Border Patrol interacted with. So 2 million illegal crossings. That's not counting all the people who came here illegally. And it has just become a deluge across that border because the what the Biden administration is doing down there, it is a crisis. And it impacts us here in Nebraska. The Omaha DEA, you know, Drug Enforcement Administration, last year confiscated 26 kilograms of fentanyl. That's 10 times the amount they did in 2020. And that's because of the open border on the Mexican, you know, the mm-hmm. open southern border. And it has a human cost here. You know, Taryn Griffith was a, a young mom, took a prescription drug uh, pill that somebody gave her with fentanyl in it. And she overdosed and died, left behind two small children. I mean, she was 24 years old and ended that life so tragically. And that's the human cost of the president not doing his job on the southern border. It impacts us right here in Nebraska. And that's why we continue to ask the Biden administration to do take this seriously. And, of course, uh, we just found out today that, thank goodness, the mask mandate got overturned. But he was going to keep enforcing that. He's extended the public health emergency, and yet he was going to release the emergency on the southern border. Well, is still planning on May 23rd, ending the Title 42 Remain in Mexico policy as part of the pandemic precautions. So he actually wants to treat illegal immigrants better than he's treating our own citizens here. It's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. And folks, if you haven't been paying attention, we're on pace to double that two million. Absolutely. Um, this Should year, be more this year. And uh, once Title 42, you're looking at eighteen thousand a day. I mean, the numbers are staggering. This invasion on our southern border um governor last question any plans i feel like you'll be on the show more but uh, yeah I'm, my, you're not getting rid of me that easy Jack. i know i'm not the legislative sessions over not my term yet i know but you know <laughs> the, the listeners i always try to give them their due they wanted to know any any plans afterwards uh well, after I'm your term's up gonna go on vacation with my wife so i can stay married that's important i want to stay married and then i do want to remain involved in politics or policy but you know, governor is a big job. You can't take your eye off the ball. I got to continue to focus on this sure. for the next, uh, you know, eight and a half months. Well, we appreciate your valuable time and uh, and a little extra time today on Drive Time Lincoln. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, that's Governor Pete Ricketts here on Drive Time Lincoln. Really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be back with uh, Branch Stoke Observatory and Child Evangelism Fellowship. John DeSauer. You're getting the 411 from DTL with Commander Jack Riggins on 1499.3 KLIN. All right, we're back. Uh, Governor Ricketts is out of the building. We had a good 45 minutes uh, with Governor talking all things in the legislative session, uh, highlights and things he's proud of, unemployment all-time high here in Nebraska. Uh, but we're transitioning to Matt Anderson from the Branch Oak Observatory and Child Evangelism Fellowship. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad you're able to squeeze me in. Yeah, no problem. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm friends of the stars. Uh, Johnny, if he was here, he always likes to make fun of me because I'll say uh, astrology, astronomy, <laughs> one of the two. And Nancy, I see your text, but unfortunately, the governor's left the building, so I can't ask that question. Uh, what do you guys got going on between the two groups? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm just going to go in chronological order here, so we're going to bounce back and forth. So come 
coming up here on the 20th here for Child Evangelism and Fellowship, we have our leadership seminar called Leaders Lead. And this is where we invite uh, community members uh, that have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and they share that. And then what, what has that meant for them both personally uh, professionally and as a family person, and then being able to share some great leadership skills. Uh, the assistant fire chief for Lincoln Fire and Rescue, Pat Borer, uh, is going to be our speaker this Wednesday. So if you're interested in coming, you'd like to hear, because uh, I'm sure he's got some great stories to tell. Uh, go to our CEF website, cefnebraska.org, uh, and you can RSVP. We're going to feed you. Uh, doors open at 11.30, so 11.30 to noon. Uh, open networking and uh, you'll you'll get fed. Uh, Pat will be speaking from noon to 12.30 and 12.30 to 12.45. Learn a little bit about Child Evangelism Fellowship, and then we'll just wrap it up with a, either a Q&A or just some open networking. Uh, doors, like I say, open at 11.30, and so we definitely want to see uh, you there. The 23rd, switching hats back to the Branch Oak Observatory, from 7 to 9 p.m., we're going to be having our a volunteer drive. So we're looking for volunteers. Do you love teaching? Do you love the night sky? Have you had a fascination with the night sky? Well, all you have to do is have a desire to want to learn, and we can help you out with the rest. Uh, seven to nine, we're going to feed you. Got a great little pizza party going on, uh, behind the scenes tour. Get a chance to put your hands and eyeballs on some great telescopes, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have you come on out family friendly. Will the weather hold up do you think this time oh man i'll tell you what um th- that's a good question it seems like anytime we plan something it snows or it rains and uh so if that doesn't work out we may have to push that back another week but we, we got our fingers crossed uh coming up on the 29th the following week after that uh, we're partnering with james arthur vineyards our wine and stargazing wildly successful and popular last year uh, and we don't anticipate anything different we've already had one and it worked out really really well so uh, you can go to the james arthur uh, vineyard website or you can go to our uh, ce uh, correction go to our branch Oak observatory uh, facebook page and you can register through there and then finally on may 6th uh, we're going to have our spring into summer uh, child evangelism and fellowship uh, fundraiser it's a family fundraiser going to be at camp solaris so just south of hickman uh, it's going to be a, a great opportunity uh, it's uh, ten dollars a car right so uh, if you can pack in you know 50 people into a clown car uh, you can get in for 10 bucks and then we're going to have food fun uh, the branch oak observatory is going to be there with telescopes for uh, doing the one thing uh, that your mother told you to never do is a look at the sun and we can do it very safely and then as it gets dark will transition over to some nighttime viewing as well holy cow you went through that pretty quick and good thanks jack um i had a couple of thoughts um i'm wondering are people during the uh james arthur uh vineyard uh, dual event or is it the optics being so clear or is it the fact they've had a little uh wine well i think the, the wine enhances the uh, enhances the activity enhances the experience you know we uh, it's a great time for people to come out one uh we love partnering with james arthur you know local business uh if you never had a chance to meet uh, jim and his family what what a what a great couple and the fact that uh, he has a great product and then we can share that with others uh we we've had nothing but great compliments from that event no, I bet. Uh, Leaders lead. Let's go back to that one because I know you guys put these on quite a bit. And folks, I, I know that uh, you always get speakers in and people um, that, A, you can get to know in your community, but have a lot of great leadership insights and, of course, the networking opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. So this year, totally, if if, if uh, you were able to come to all of them, uh, in 2022, we're going to have 22 different speakers that's 22 different leadership skill sets everybody's going to bring something different and unique to uh to these leaders lead so the first tuesday of every month uh, we have our leaders lead first tuesdays and so that's at 7 45 a.m for you early birds and that runs until 9 15. we just started the leaders lead luncheon series and uh, this will be our third installment so so far we've had we kicked it off with tom osborne uh, we had steve glenn uh, this last month and now we're going to have uh, the assistant fire chief pat borer the following month we're going to have somebody uh, that you're very familiar with too and, and that's going to be karen bowling with with Nebraska Family Alliance uh, coming up in May. So that's coming up. And then uh, for the morning, 
in May, May 3rd, uh, we're going to have State Senator John Arch. So uh, really bringing a lot of different people from different walks of life, uh, like say different leadership skill sets. And I guess that's what I like about that. And so far, it's been met very favorably. Yeah, that that is a lot of different skill sets in different areas. But I, I think that, uh, at least from my own leadership journey, the more uh, diverse you can get and broad and understanding how other people have uh, done it, uh, the better you become as a leader. And uh, certainly uh, with the education uh, that you guys provide in Child Evangelism Fellowship, uh, you know, having a faith-based uh, point in leadership is always a great thing. Uh, it is, and uh, we just want to show that, you know, one, you can be a successful Christian. Um, and the whole idea, of course, our ministry is bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to elementary age kids, and we're very blessed to be able to do that. The whole idea behind the leader's lead is that, you know, those kids grow up. And when they grow up, they become involved in their community. And, of course, there's always two sides of the coin, right? To either productive members to society uh, or they're not. And, you know, we, you can have a long discussion on either one of those. But if we can show uh, that if you make an investment, in uh, an investment is always, I won't say always provides a return, but an investment always has the potential for a return. Yeah. And then when you have individuals within the community that are, um, uh, successful, uh, whatever it happens to be, coach, politician, business person, uh, we are, uh, uh, we want to be able to show what that potentially looks like. And so when they invest into the ministry, uh, they have that option or the availability to have that return on their investment. Yeah, you never know when the the spark, as I like to say, it uh, from you know you're using the investment analogy. It's a good analogy, by the way. But I always say the spark, and if you think back, all of us in our lifetimes, how many people have given us that spark, and sometimes yeah. you don't realize it until later. Um, I always, you know, this one's for the parents out there, or even the kids, if you're listening. I guess I can't tell parents what to do, um, but uh, kids, it's actually three things: you either become a productive member of society, a neutral. Or a negative. So it's like passing the football. Two out of the three things that can happen are bad, and we don't want you to be a neutral or negative. You want to get all the education and all the motivation to be a positive member of our society once you're out of the bird's nest, as we like to say. Absolutely. And then switching hats back here again, Jack, i got to tell you, we're excited about the next project coming up. That is our Earth, Moon, Earth project that we have. All the equipment has been ordered. And so we're starting to see some of that filter in. Uh, our hope is... Uh, that will get everything and have it all up and running by late summer, certainly by our barbecue that we're going to have coming up here in September, and that is going to be a phenomenal experience. Without giving it all away, I'm going to tell you that not only will you be able to come and enjoy sending your voice to the moon and back, nobody else in the world is doing that at a public observatory. And uh, this is the exciting part, and there's a whole bunch of different moving parts that are going to be fun and interesting, and you don't want to miss that when in, when we have that running. No, you've got to bounce your voice off the moon for Everybody sure. Everybody does, yeah. Um, I need to ask you, I thought I just read that we have an event, meaning either uh, moon in front of the sun, earth in front of the sun. What's going on with the sun and, and the, the stars out there? What's coming up big time? Yep, so we have uh, our lunar eclipse coming up here. And uh, uh, you don't want to you don't want to miss that. That is coming up here in May. And uh, the unique thing about this is it's going to be a total lunar eclipse. And so uh, you know this, you're going to see uh, the very beginning of the the eclipse, which will be with the Umbra. And as the evening goes on, we're going to be running up until 1 a.m. when it starts to exit. And as it gets darker. Or as the the, uh, the eclipse becomes more prominent, the sky becomes darker, and uh, it will be really a unique experience. And in addition to that, while that's all going on, uh, we'll have the opportunity to uh, use our SATCOM array uh, that we have, uh, and that's going to be fun to be able to talk to and through the International Space Station, other low-orbiting satellites that are amateur radio capable. So a lot of different things going on, but being able to see the moon go into total eclipse, that is going to be incredible. Matt Anderson uh, from Branch Oak Observatory and Child Evangelism Fellowship uh, breaking down some of the events uh, coming up. I'll tell you what, in the next, uh, er, with two minutes left, I have to geek out just a little bit. Um, I'm hearing about lasers from a far distant galaxy. Have you do done any re reading, excuse me, about that? I have not done. Oh. I cannot believe I... I, I I'm sorry, Jack. We're getting a I, signal. Uh, they say laser beam. It caught my eye. So let's switch to James Webb. 
because I'm still obsessed about James Webb. Yeah, James Webb is out there. They're doing all the final calibrations on it. Uh, as Michael was talking about there, about how it uh, stays in place there. Mm-hmm. Um, the images, some of the preliminary images that they've had coming back are already phenomenal, and they haven't really done uh, uh, all what they have, have intended to do. And it's going to be exciting once that is up and running full-time. The images that come out of that will be amazing. Well, they'll be the best ever. And I, that's why I keep bringing it up, folks, because if you don't pay attention to science um, and astro- astrology, <laughs> astronomy, <laughs> I got everybody laughing. It just slips off my tongue. I think it's because my wife always says, you know, that I'm a Scorpio, which means uh, I'm a, I'm a little uh, up and down on my mood, I guess. But <laughs> astronomy, it, it's the, the James Webb Telescope is the pinnacle of science. It is. It's incredible. Yeah. Like the, literally the latest and greatest in in science and technology. Yes. It is, it is going to be phenomenal. Well, Matt, I appreciate you coming in and giving us that quick rundown. I appreciate the opportunity, Jack. What a what a great format to be able to do that. Well, folks, uh, that's Matt Anderson. We had uh, the governor on as well today. And if you didn't know, uh, it looks like the Biden administration will not be keeping mass mandates on for travel. They're done. Thank God. 1,499.3 KLAN Drive Time Lincoln.